Heavenly Father, as we begin another day of study, we ask that you would send your spirit and your angels to guide and direct our considerations this day. We ask that you would take control of the information that is being shared from up front, that it would be for your glory and your honor, that it would be edifying and truthful and honest. We ask that you would refresh our minds from a, a long day yesterday and open them that um, we can hear what you have for us. And we ask that in um, each of the families and the homes represented here that you will work a revival um, that doesn't just touch us in this room, but our family members that uh, aren't walking with you currently that need to be awakened um, to the fact that time is running out for them to make these kind of decisions. We thank you for bringing us together in this part of your vineyard at this time in earth's history. We ask that this uh, meeting can be used somehow to help finish the work, not here, but all over the world. In Jesus' name, amen. Um, we're going to start sermon number eight, Rome establishes the vision, uh, but before we do, there was a question that came up yesterday that I would like to answer um, for all of us here that may not have heard the question or maybe not thought about it, but maybe thought about it, and uh, it's a, it was a good question. If in the study of the book of Daniel, for, for myself, there are five different places where two words, it makes a difference to understand the two words correctly. There's two different Hebrew words that are both translated sanctuary. We looked a little bit at that yesterday. There's two Hebrew words that are both translated take away. We looked a little bit at that. There's um, two Hebrew words that are translated vision. We, we're going to look at that as we go into this study. But then there's also um, two other places where it's not necessarily that it's two Hebrew words translated the same way. It's just that there's two instances where there's some close relationship that people stumble over or battle over, however you want to um, express the idea. One of them, when you're dealing with the last six verses of Daniel 11, um, in verse 41, you have the glorious land. In verse 45, you have the glorious holy mountain. And in Adventism today, the primary argument over these verses is that the glorious land is the Seventh-day Adventist church, or the glorious land is the United States of America. I, no doubt there's other ideas on what those are, but the predominant argument is, is the glorious land in verse 41 the Seventh-day Adventist church, or is it the United States of America? Those people that um, suggest that the glorious land in verse 41 is the Seventh-day Adventist church uh, they, they connect the glorious land in verse 45 with the glorious holy mountain. Everyone's in agreement, basically everyone is in agreement, that the glorious holy mountain in verse 45 is God's church. Uh, you can go to several places um, in Scripture and show that the glorious holy mountain in Scripture or God's holy hill or Zion or Jerusalem, and there are several other names, that represent Jerusalem or God's church. And when you take it in the last days after the time period of cross, um, it's not literal Jerusalem. It's not the literal mountain in Jerusalem. It's the Seventh-day Adventist church. The easiest passage in Scripture to see that is, I think, is Isaiah 2. In verse 2 of Isaiah 2, it starts, and in the last days. So it, it, verse 2 places it at the end of the world, what Isaiah is going to say after verse 2. You know he's talking about at the end of the world, and then he goes on to say in the last days, God's uh, mountain will be established above all the mountains, and, and it, it's clearly an illustration of God's church in the last days. So th everyone's pretty much in agreement that the glorious holy mountain in verse 45 is God's church. But the people that believe the glorious land um, of verse 41 is also God's church. For me, what they're doing is they're taking a distinction that Daniel purposely makes and overlooking it. If, if Daniel wanted to say that the glorious land in verse 41 was God's church, he would have said glorious holy mountain. The fact that he said glorious land in verse 41 and glorious holy mountain in verse 45 is evidence that Daniel was making some type of distinction. Now, the 
the first presentation on Friday night, we referred just a little bit to inspiration's endorsement of the pioneers of Adventism. And there's many other quotes where Sister White upholds the, the foundation principles that were established by the pioneers. And the Bible upholds them too. When the Bible is talking about seek ye the old paths, um, there is a sense that that's, that's calling Christians to seek out the, the established foundations of the Bible. But for Seventh-day Adventists at the end of the world, the old paths is pointing more to the foundational work of Adventism than necessarily the doctrines that were lost during the Dark Ages, to man's understanding. So, um, with the endorsement of the pioneers, you'll find that there is an article um, that was written by J.N. Andrews right after the Great Disappointment. And the purpose of the article has nothing to do with uh, the glorious land of verse 41 or the glorious holy mountain of verse 45 of Daniel 11. That, Andrews wasn't addressing that at all, but what Andrews was addressing was wh what was it that made William Miller and the Millerites misunderstand the sanctuary? What was it that led them to believe that the sanctuary was the earth? You know, after the great disappointment, if they were going to say that the Lord had led the Millerite movement all that time, then they had to go back in and make a defense, show why the misunderstanding took place, and clarify what it really meant. And in Adventism, there is a, an article that J.N. Andrews put together. It's just, it's Bible-based. It's just full of the Bible. I mean, there's very little of J.N. Andrews' words. Um, but he goes in and shows the verses, you know, where William Miller was led to believe that the sanctuary was the earth, but then he goes through and he dissects the sanctuary through the scriptures, and he comes to a conclusion, and his conclusion, one of his conclusions is this. He ends up associating four things um, that are closely associated with, with uh, the sanctuary. Um, he identifies the land of Israel, the earth, he had to address the earth, because that's what William Miller was dealing with, uh, the sanctuary, and God's people, the church. So he ends up coming to four symbols uh, in the Bible that, he, that he's addressing in this study. The sanctuary, the earth, the land of Israel where the sanctuary is at, and the people of Israel, the church, that live in the land of Israel and worship at the sanctuary. So he makes... He draws his evidence from the Bible that those four things are different. So, you know, this is his argument. Uh, William Miller was misunderstanding that the sanctuary was the sanctuary and it wasn't the earth. And that was his point. But his conclusion was, is that the sanctuary is different than the earth, God's people, or the land of Israel. And uh, the earth was different than the sanctuary, the land of Israel, and the children of Israel, and he, he went through and broke them all four down. They're all different. So what I'm saying is, a foundational statement in Adventism that was written by J.N. Andrews, who the main university in Adventism for teaching the men that are supposed to go out and take the truth of the world, Andrews University, is that's his namesake. Um, he put together a paper shortly after the Great Disappointment, which says although he doesn't address it specifically, this is the conclusion, is that the glorious holy mountain representing God's church is different than the glorious land, the land of Israel. They have to be different. So that wh Whether you understand what I'm getting at or not, what I'm getting at, I'm sure you understand it, is that a pioneer foundational principle in Adventism is that the glorious land is different than the glorious holy mountain. And the glorious holy mountain is definitely God's church. Therefore, the glorious land cannot be God's church. So that is a fourth area in Daniel for me where there's you know, two words or two symbols that have a close relationship that you need to, you need to deal with besides takeaway or sanctuary or vision, which we're going to deal with next. Now the other one is where the question came up yesterday, and this takes a little bit of background to in terms of how I understand it, maybe there's a better way to understand it. I believe without a doubt that one of the ways that you can express and summarize the work of Seventh-day Adventists is that we are the ones at the end of the world that are called to be the experts on Babylon. You are, the final warning message is Revelation 18. 
And if you look closely in Revelation 18, it comes in two parts. The angel that comes down and lightens the earth with his glory, and then another voice calls men and women out of Babylon. And if you look at the first few verses where the, the first part of Revelation 18, 1 through 5 is located, you'll see that what's happening there is a description of Babylon. You know, it's, uh, it's more describing the, the characteristics of Babylon that leads to the close of probation, and then the, the other voice is calling people out of Babylon. And the point is this. The first part of the fourth angel's message is a description of Babylon. And if we're the ones that are going to be proclaiming the fourth angel's message, then I believe we are to be the experts on modern Babylon. That's our message. Come out of Babylon. This is Babylon. So Seventh-day Adventists should understand Babylon better than anyone else. And in Revelation 16, Babylon is divided into three parts. As we go through our studies today, uh, you're going to come across uh, some references that will support what I'm saying. I'm not necessarily going to support it now, but in Revelation 16, verse 19... Modern Babylon is divided into three parts. Verses 12 and 13 of Revelation 16 tell us what these three parts are. This is standard Adventist understanding. The threefold makeup the, of modern Babylon is the beast, the dragon, and the false prophet. So what my logic here is this. If we're to call people out of Babylon, if we're to the ones that are going to identify the characteristics of Babylon at the end of the world, then we should know a great deal about the beast, the dragon, and the false prophet. Okay, and there is much to know about these three powers that Seventh-day Adventists, by and large, haven't paid attention to. But the, here's the question that was raised yesterday, and then I'll go into the beast, dragon, and false prophet and try to bring a little bit of clarity into the answer um, that I gave yesterday, a little bit more information. Each... Each of these three powers in Bible prophecy have their own characteristics unto themselves. Um, the beast, we know, is the papacy. The papacy uh, expresses of itself, and inspiration says the same thing, Rome never changes. Okay, so one of the characteristics, prophetic, just one of them, there's several characteristics associated with the papacy, the beast, but one of the characteristics, just for an example, is that Rome never changes. The false prophet is the United States. And one of the prophetic characteristics of the United States is it changes. It begins as a lamb, ends up speaking as a dragon. So all I'm doing is trying to draw an illustration that each of these powers have their own characteristics unto themselves. So you see my point. You know, simple example, Rome doesn't change, the United States does change. The United States, when it begins, and ends has two horns. Horns represent strengths. And the two horns of strength for the United States when it begins is republicanism and Protestantism. We all know this, great controversy, very common understanding in Adventism. But at the end of the world, when the United States is forcing the world to, to receive the mark of the beast, they're not upholding Protestantism and republicanism, but they still have two horns. And the two horns of strength for the United States at the end of the world are military and economic strength, because in Revelation 13, where the United States is identified, they're forcing the world to receive the mark of the beast in order to buy or sell economic strength, or the, if you don't have the mark of the beast, you're put to death military strength. So even though it's not explicitly identified in there, the United States changes, and the two horns of strength for the United States that are at the end are not republicanism and Protestantism, it's military and economic strength. Um, so that's an example of that each of these Powers have own characteristics under themselves. Now, here's one I want to focus on in order to get to Dennis's question yesterday. In prophecy, the papacy is seated in Rome, the city of Rome, from the beginning to the end. Even in Revelation 17, which portrays the end of the papacy, it's in verse 9, is it? It's set, seated upon the seven-hilled city, and uh, a standard, correct Protestant before Millerites and pioneer understanding is that the seven hilled city there is the city of Rome. And, that, and it, it may have secondary and tertiary meanings, but primarily Rome is, the papacy is seated, it's located in the city of Rome from the beginning until the end. Same with the United States. 
the false prophet, changes. It begins as Protestant America. It ends up as apostate Protestantism. It changes. It begins as Protestant America, and at some point in time, it begins to fulfill its role as the false prophet of Bible prophecy. But from the beginning unto the end, the United States is in the United States. Geographically, it's located there. Not so with the dragon. Not so with the dragon. And here's, here's where we're getting to the question. The question was, and it's one that if you're dealing with verses 40 to 45 of Daniel 11, at some point in time, you need to be confronted with this because you need to be settled in your mind, um, this question. Uh, Daniel 11 establishes an internal rule within the chapter that identifies who the king of the south and the king of the north is. And you can read Uriah Smith's book. He expresses this rule that's in Daniel 11. And the rule is the power that controls Egypt is the king of the south and the power that controls Babylon. Uriah Smith will say Syria, but Syria included Babylon. The power that controls Babylon is the king of the north. That's the internal rule in chapter 11 of Daniel that al allows you to identify who the king of the south and who the king of the north are. So in verse 40, we're, we teach correctly, I believe, that the king of the south in verse 40 initially is atheistic France because um, in the time period of the time of the end, the verse begins and at the time of the end, 1798, takes place after the cross. And uh, one of the most important rules in Bible prophecy is that prophecy that's fulfilled before the time period of the cross is understood in its literal application. And prophecy that's fulfilled after the time period of the cross is understood in its spiritual application. This, some people say, is the most important rule in Bible prophecy. Um, I don't like to prioritize which are the most important, but it may very well be. It is the one rule in Bible prophecy that has a history associated with it. Um, every Protestant reformer, at some point in their personal growth of understanding, came to the position that the Pope of Rome was the Antichrist of Bible prophecy. Every one of them. And they reached this conclusion by applying this rule. Before the cross, prophecy is understood in its literal application. After the cross, spiritual application. During the time period of what historians call the Counter-Reformation, after the Reformation was underway, Rome uh, launched its own counterattack to stop the Protestant Reformation, and history calls that the Counter-Reformation. And during the Counter-Reformation, one of the things that Rome did was take two of its ablest scholars and give them the assignment of going and inventing a rule of Bible prophecy that would destroy this rule and eliminate the ability to identify the Pope of Rome as the Antichrist of Bible prophecy. This is a historical fact. They came up with three rules. Uh, they're all still in Christianity today. Um, a couple of them are more predominant than the third. And uh, you can go back into history. You can get books about this very thing I'm telling you about. And up until the beginning of the 20th century, you can find Protestant books that ridiculed ridiculed Catholicism over these rules, you know, talking about how, how insane and stupid Catholicism was for trying to, you know, apply these rules because they don't hold up. They're, they're man-made rules that you cannot support from the scriptures. But at the turn of the 20th century, uh, there was a Bible produced called the Schofield Bible, and Schofield incorporated um, study notes into that Bible that used these Catholic principles of prophetic interpretation, and as Protestants began to buy the Schofield Bible, <coughs> Protestants began to uh, come to understand <laughs> these Catholic principles. So all I'm saying here, <laughs> and now you know, Protestantism is directed by these Catholic principles, and they've made their way into Adventism, and all I'm saying here is this particular rule of before the cross literal, after the cross um, spiritual application of prophecy, it's a rule that has a history outside of the Bible, and there's very few rules that I know of that have that. So when you get to verse 40, at the time of the end, 1798, the internal rule, internal rule in Daniel 11 is the power that controls Egypt is the king of the south, but in 1798, after the cross, we're looking for the power that controls spiritual Egypt. And in Revelation 11, verse 8, we're told of who the power is that controls spiritual Egypt. Um, it's atheistic France, and this is the, the argument that the king of the south 
is atheistic France at the beginning of verse 40. And if you read God's Helping Hand, which Sister White, that's what Sister White calls the book Daniel and Revelation by Uriah Smith, if you read God's Helping Hand, when he's dealing with this rule of King of the South and the King of the North, he makes a point to say that the power that's the King of the South or the King of the North at this point in history, as history moves forward, it changes. As a new power conquers Egypt, it becomes the King of the South. And, and Uriah Smith, the pioneers, understood this. And we suggest that in verse 40, as history progressed, a new power that dominated the philosophy of atheism, um, spiritual Egypt, was the Soviet Union that came into history in 1917 at the Bolshevik Revolution. So the question that is raised that you need to think about is in verse 40, we're saying that the king of the south is determined by the power that controls Egypt, but then in verses 42 and 43, after the papacy has conquered the king of the south, the power that controls Egypt, then in verses 42 and 43, the papacy goes and conquers Egypt. You, you see, the, the, there's a close relationship. So the first, the answer I gave yesterday when this was raised, which is where I usually start, but I didn't have time to follow up, is that <coughs> there's a close relationship between Egypt in verses 42 and 43 and the king of the south in verse 40. And it's, it's a, a, a more deep and profound relationship than you realize at the surface. But there's a, a distinction made by Daniel. Daniel still is the one that makes the distinction. In verse 40, it's the king of the south. In verses 42 and 43, it's Egypt. So Daniel's telling us there is some difference, okay? So what is the difference? One of the ways you understand this difference, in my understanding, is this. When you look at the beast, the dragon, and the false prophet, the characteristic of the beast, one of the characteristics, is it's always in Rome, false prophet is always in the United States, but not so with the dragon. The dragon begins at the Tower of Babel with Nimrod, and then it, it's, it's there in uh, Nebuchadnezzar and Belshazzar's Babylon. And the religious elite of Babylon, the, the leaders of the religion of Babylon, in history and in the book of Daniel are called the Chaldeans. And the historians tell us that when Babylon fell, the Chaldeans in Babylon, they moved to a certain city. Anyone know what that city is? It's Pergamos. And that's why in Revelation, in the message to Pergamos, it says, I know, I know, I forget exactly, that's, we can read it. I, we don't need to take this much time, but we can. In, in 2, 2.19 of Revelation, um, I know where thou dwellest, where Satan's seat is. Um, it's 2.13. I'll start in 2.12. And unto the angel of the church in Pergamos write, These things saith he which hath the sharp sword with two edges, I know thy works, and where thou dwellest, even where Satan's seat is. The Chaldeans of Babylon had moved to Pergamos and set up their religious center in the city of Pergamos. So what I want you to see here is, is the dragon power. And this is the dragon power. The dragon power is Satan. He began in Babylon. And when Babylon fell, he moved to Pergamos. Histori this is documented by historians. This isn't just afterthought by Adventists. And then there came a time period where pagan Rome comes into history, and it begins to conquer the world. And there came a point in time where pagan Rome conquered Pergamos. And the custom of pagan Rome that, that allows historians to call pagan Rome pagan Rome is that when they conquered uh, a nation or a city that was worshiping uh, pagan idolatry in a different style than they at that point in time possessed, they would take the, the deities and the priests of that sanctuary and they would move them back to the city of Rome and build them their own section in the Pantheon Temple. So when pagan Rome conquered Pergamos, they did this very thing. They took the Chaldeans that were worshiping in Pergamos, and they brought them back to the city of Rome. And so what you're seeing with the dragon power, is the dragon power begins in Babylon. Then it moves to Pergamos. Then it moves to the city of Rome. And the prophetic testimony is, is that pagan Rome disintegrates into ten nations. So when you're considering the, the ten kingdoms of pagan Rome, this is still an expression of the dragon power. 
and three of those horns are removed, which leaves the seven European kings that came to the aid of the papacy. And it's out of one of those European kings, France, that you get the king of the south. So France being an extension of pagan Rome, and this is, this, by the way, France is clearly identified by the pioneers as an extension of pagan Rome. Um, that's how the pioneers deal with Revelation. Turn to Revelation 11. I want you to understand this isn't uh, necessarily, I'm not putting very much of my own information into this. In Revelation 11, verse 13, it says this. This is talking about France. Revelation 11 is about France during the French Revolution time period. In verse 13 it says, And the same hour was there a great earthquake, and a tenth part of the city fell. And in the earthquake were slain of men seven thousand, and the remnant were affrighted and gave glory to the God of heaven. Now this is long after the Ostrogoth, the Hurlies, and the Vandals have been plucked up. Pagan Rome disintegrated into ten kingdoms. Then the three horns are plucked up. The papacy comes in their place. But the pioneers tell us that this city here in, in verse 13 is representing the ten kingdoms of pagan Rome. It's saying this earthquake was the French Revolution that struck one of those ten nations. And the one of the ten nations that were the descendants of pagan Rome was France. This verse is talking about the, the earthquake being the French Revolution that took place in in the French Revolution. Um, and the pioneers point out that when, uh, during the French Revolution time period, when the revolt took place and uh, the royalty in France lost their heads, you know what the historians say, how many of royalty lost their heads? 7,000. So th that's how the pioneers relate to this. So all I'm saying is that in verse 40, identifying atheistic France as the king of the south, the power that controls Egypt, is still keeping them in the umbrella of the dragon power. The dragon power went from Babylon to Pergamos to pagan Rome to the ten kingdoms of pagan Rome. Then it's the king of the south, France, in, in that time period. And then it ends up being where? In Russia. Still, still in the area of Europe that pagan Rome was centered in. So the question is, is is uh, how is it that we identify Egypt differently than we do the king of the south? And it's this. After the dragon moves from Babylon to Pergamos to the city of Rome to the ten kingdoms of pagan Rome, then to France in the French Revolution, then to the Soviet Union, then the Soviet Union collapses in fulfillment of verse 40. And note that the first thing that Gorbachev did when he retired from the Soviet Union, is he took a job in the United Nations. And the United Nations is an extension. It's the next place the dragon power goes. And we're suggesting that when the papacy conquers Egypt in verse 42 and 43, it's identifying when the papacy takes control of the entire world, and the papacy takes control of the entire world by coming into a church-state relationship with a one-world government that we know as the United Nations. So, so the, the movement of the dragon, this is the point I'm making, is these two powers stay, are stationary in history, but the dragon, it moves through history. And the dragon power, in the prophetic view of things, once the Soviet Union went down, the dragon moved to its final point of uh, where it comes to its end in the United Nations. Now, if we... Typically, um, if we ask Seventh-day Adventists what, uh, is the, what's the dragon represent in Bible prophecy, the answer typically is spiritualism because Sister White um, tells us that the beast represents Catholicism, the dragon represents spiritualism, and the false prophet represents apostate Protestantism. She plainly says that. There's another thing about these, these powers that we need to factor in is that each of these powers have both a political and a spiritual manifestation. Uh, the, the spiritual manifestation of the Vatican is Catholicism. The political manifestation of the papacy is it's a monarchy. The Pope of Rome is a kingly power. It's a monarchy. 
the political manifestation of the United States is republicanism or democracy. The spiritual manifestation of the United States is Protestantism. Even when it goes into apostasy, it's still apostate Protestantism. The religious manifestation of the dragon power is spiritualism. So when Sister White says that, she's correct. Uh, you know, she's always correct. But she also has this statement, and uh, this is to Testimonies to Ministers, page 38. Kings and rulers and governors have placed upon themselves the brand of Antichrist and are represented as the dragon who goes to make war with the saints, with those who keep the commandments of God and who have the faith of Jesus. There's a lot to be said about that. The point is this, as Sister White talks about it, a group of, not a singular, a group of political leadership, kings, rulers, and governors, uh, a, you know, a confederacy of politicians that, are, that represent the dragon during the time period of the Sunday Law. This is one of the arguments that the dragon is the United Nations. And there are a lot of arguments, a lot of arguments for that. And we're going to develop some more in future studies. All I was doing was getting s some more clarification on how Yes, Egypt and the king of the south are closely related. The power that controls Egypt is the king of the south. But the fact that Daniel makes a distinction in verse 40 and verses 42 and 43 tells us there's, there's some difference. But the reality of it are it's just it's two places in history, two different manifestations of the dragon power. He moves through history using different political organizations at different times in history. You'll notice also, just as point of reference, for Brother Lewis. I know you know this, but we'll get it on the record. Uh, the dragon power starts at the Tower of Babel. It's the power that opposes God and his people until the 538 time period, when the pap papacy came in before 538, but in terms of marking it with a time prophecy. 538, we have our second power that's going to oppose God and his people. The dragon power didn't fall off the face of the earth at that time. From 538, then you have papalism and paganism in the world opposing God and his people. And at the time period that the papacy receives its deadly wound in 1798, then we see the third power coming into history, the United States. And uh, at the end of the world, that's what Revelation 16 says, is we have three powers that come together to oppose God and his people. The point is this. The first power is the dragon power. So when Daniel is a is symbolizing the dragon power in the book of Daniel, he chooses the word continual. This is the power that has continually opposed God and his people throughout history. This was the second, this was the third. So the fact that Daniel uses the word continual, which is translated as daily, is consistent with the meaning of what the dragon power is. It's continually been in history opposing God and his people. And you'll notice the word continual in every book of the Bible except the book of Daniel is a verb, but in the book of Daniel, it's a noun. It's a, it's a, it's a symbol. It's a symbol of the dragon power. Um, the vision. Rome establishes the vision. In Daniel 8.14, <coughs> it says this, And in those times there shall many stand up against the king of the south, also the robbers of thy people, shall exalt themselves to establish the vision, but they shall fall. A couple years ago, a friend of mine invited some speakers and some um, listeners to come to the Lifestyle Center of America in Oklahoma, and uh, ended up only two speakers uh, agreed to make a presentation on Daniel 11. Um, the friend of mine had contacted, I believe it was Shea at the Biblical Research Institute, and said, who, do you, who would you select to come and present Daniel 11, verses 40 to 45? And he recommended an, a man named Frank Hardy, uh, who has, had did his master thesis on the last six verses of Daniel 11. And he, he's, uh, he works at the General Conference, and a very nice man. He came out to Oklahoma, and we went to Oklahoma, and he, uh, Brother Hardy would present his understanding of Daniel 1140 to 45 for 45 minutes, and then he would field uh, questions and answers for 30 minutes from about 25 to 30 people that had been invited to attend. And then I would present how I understood Daniel 1140 to 45 for 45 minutes, and then I would take 30 minutes of questions and answers, and we went like that for three or four days. And uh, 
there, there's a whole lot about the Bible that I don't understand. So he, he was... He was approaching his presentation differently than I. He started it right at Daniel 11, verse 1, and he marched through the verses to make his point. And when he got to verse 14, I, I, I never, you know, I just never heard what he said before. It just kind of blew my mind. When you get to verse 14, um, I, and I don't know where I came to, con- sometimes I've come across a, a symbol in the Bible, and I've had to go out, go and study and figure out what, how do I understand this symbol? What does it mean? And do some homework on it. And I can remember how I came to that understanding. But I don't know how I came to the understanding that the robbers of thy people in verse 14 is pagan Rome. But I had that in my head, probably from the Uriah Smith's book. But I don't know. I just knew the robbers of thy people in verse 14 is representing pagan Rome. And I'd never heard any different. And when Brother Hardy got to this point, he said, no, this is, this is one of the last Syrian kings, Antiochus Epiphanes. And I'm just going, oh, and, okay, I've never heard that one before. And brothers and sisters, this makes a big difference. Because what it says about whoever the robbers of thy people are, they are the prophetic truth that establishes the vision. So when, when he said that, I, I, I had other fish to fry. There was a lot of things about well, that he said that I could have responded to, but I, I had to keep on track. I never said anything to him. And then shortly thereafter, um, I'm reading one of the presentations by William Miller. And I realized that William Miller actually took the time to address this verse because it was an argument during the Millerite movement. I never knew that. And what what William Miller was doing is he was opposing the reasoning of the Protestant churches because the Protestant churches believed the robbers of thy people here in this verse was Antiochus Epiphanes. And William Miller says, no way. He says, you know, this... This, uh, the subject of William Miller's reasoning is, is the subject in t- verses 12 and 13 is the king of the north, one of these Syrian kings. And verse 14, it's still talking about these Syrian kings. And it says, in those times, in the times of these Syrian kings, there shall many stand up against the king of the south. You know, the king of the south, the Syrian kings are the king of the north. That's the discussion of this verse. And then it says, also the robbers of thy people. So William Miller's argument is very simple. He says the verse is already discussing the Syrian kings, then it introduces the king of the south, but when it says also thy robbers of thy people, it's obvious by the language that this is a new power. That was William Miller's reasoning, and it's sound. And then he goes on to say it's Rome in the prophecies of Daniel that exalts itself. It's Rome in the prophecies of Daniel that falls, and it's Rome that establishes the vision. So even though I never really knew it when I was first hearing this Antiochus Epiphanes for the first time. This is an ancient argument in Adventism. And uh, brothers and sisters, it makes a great deal of difference on who you understand the robbers of thy people to be. Um, Because there is a vision at the end of the world that we need to understand because it's the message of the hour and it's the message that awakens us to our condition that we might prepare for the seal of God and to have the wrong... Um, you know, reference for bringing that vision into place is it's very detrimental to coming to a correct understanding. So anyway, we are, we're suggesting that the vision, you see that underneath this, the vision in terms of the message, the, the sequence of events that is the message for the hour is the last six verses of Daniel 11. You see them under he, underneath here. Um, and we're going to move through this thought of vision now for a little while. Um, they that be wise, down at the bottom of page seven, 78, is some of the passages from Daniel that we've already been d- dwelling on in the beginning, that there was an increase of knowledge in the Millerite time period that the wise understood, but the wicked didn't understand. There's going to be an increase of knowledge at the end of the world that the wise virgins understand, but the foolish virgins will not understand. And... Uh, we read the quote from Sister White where Sister White says, there will be an increase in knowledge that prepares God's people to stand in the latter days. And then a couple paragraphs later, she says, she speaks about the papacy and the Sunday law. And she says, but there's to be an increase of knowledge on this subject where she really s- focuses in that the increase of knowledge is about the papacy and the Sunday law. And of course, the last six verses of Daniel 11 is talking about the king of the north, the papacy, and how the Sunday law arrives in verse 41 in the United States. And then in verses 42 and 43, the whole world is forced to accept the Sunday law. So, you know, that's the 
the, one of the basis for saying that the increase of knowledge for us at the end of the world is these verses. There's several other arguments. But a casual reading of the book of Daniel, and, and I think this is how we all do it. I certainly didn't understand this for many years after I was reading the book of Daniel. A casual reading of the book of Daniel leads you to believe that there's just one Hebrew word that is translated vision when there is really two. And on page 79, you'll see these two visions, two Hebrew words for vision. Um, you'll see the places in the book of Daniel where both these words are found. And uh, the, the mare, uh, the Hebrew word mare that's translated as vision in the book of Daniel, is a, is a singular, it's a snapshot, where is the chazon is the complete vision. It's the whole role of video. The mare is one slide from that video. There's a, there's a difference in these two Hebrew words, and until you um, isolate that difference, you miss some of the meaning about what Daniel's saying with the, the vision. Uh, I'll remind you where we went the other day in our meeting after lunch, I believe it was, that in verse 13 of Daniel 8, when it, the question is asked, how long shall be the vision concerning the daily and the transgression of desolation, that word vision is the complete vision. It's not the snapshot vision. So the, the, the question is on, about dur duration. How long? It's not, the question in verse 13 is not about point in time. It doesn't say when, it's how long. If it asks when is the vision of the daily and the transgression of desolation, then it would be asking for a certain day for that vision to take place. But it asks how long, duration. And of course, the Seventh-day Adventists, we know the answer in the next verse, verse 14, is 2,300 years. So we see the answer concerns duration as well. And we know when the duration concluded, October 22, 1844. So when it comes to identifying what the daily is, if you're going to believe that the daily is the work of Christ in the heavenly sanctuary, the earliest date that you can place is when Christ ascended to the heavenly sanctuary, 31 A.D. Now, that's the people that believe that about the daily. They don't go back to 31. They say, you know, in the 300, 400 time period, the papacy introduced the, the worship of the mass. But it, give them the benefit of the doubt. Go all the way back to 31 A.D. at the crucifixion. Christ ascends. The question is duration. How long is the vision of the daily? If it's Christ's ministry in the sanctuary being removed, obscured, or blocked, or done away with somehow by the papacy, the earliest that could happen is 31 A.D., which means there's your starting point for the 2300-year prophecy. Where if you maintain the pioneer position that the daily represents paganism trampling down the sanctuary and the host, and the question is how long is the complete vision? Well, the complete vision in verse 13 is dealing with the complete vision of Daniel 8. And Daniel 8, the vision begins in the time period of the Medes and Persians. It, it was given in the, the reign of Belshazzar, the last king of Babylon. That's when he received the vision. But the vision itself begins with the Medes and Persians. And uh, therefore, when you ask how long, in terms of duration, shall paganism, Assyria was paganism, Babylon, Babylon was paganism, the Medes and Persians were paganism, Greece was paganism, pagan Rome was paganism, and all of those powers trampled down God's sanctuary and his people, uh, you know, except for Assyria, but Assyria certainly took God's people into captivity, the northern kingdom, but certainly Babylon trampled down the sanctuary, Medes and Persians did, Greece did, pagan Rome did. So the question is, how long is the complete vision concerning paganism and the transgression of desolation, which everyone agrees is the papacy? How long is the complete vision concerning paganism and papalism that will trample down the sanctuary and God's people. So when the pioneers identify it that way, and they're relating to Daniel 8, they say, well, Daniel 8's vision begins in the times of the Medes and Persian, and they conclude uh, that the starting point is the year 457, which is when the third decree went forth, and sure enough, the duration fits the answer, 2,300 years. That understanding alone tells me 
that the idea that the daily represents Christ's work in the heavenly sanctuary, that that's wrong. And you, you make that conclusion by being specific to the word vision. Now, if you think about it, uh, the, the other word vision means snapshot vision. If you believe the daily represents Christ's work in the heavenly sanctuary, then in verse 13, you have to treat this word vision as if it's the snapshot vision. You have to emphasize a point in time. You have to, some, it's an incorrect emphasis, but you have to emphasize, well, all we're really looking at here is October 22nd, 1844. We really don't want to talk about duration. It doesn't fit. From just the word vision. And there are other, other important points to be made about these two words, vision. Now, I believe that the snapshot vision, which you can definitely connect with the 2300-year vision, we're going to do that in a moment, but in verse 15, verse 15 of Daniel 8, you see it, the appearance of a man. Uh, it says, And it came to pass when I, even I, Daniel, had seen the complete vision, the, the chazon, chazon vision, and sought for the meaning. Then, behold, there stood before me as the appearance of a man. This word appearance is the same <coughs> word that in other places in Daniel is translated as vision, and it's the snapshot vision. This word appearance is, a, uh, is one of the Primary definitions of mare, if you look in your Strong's Concordance. For some reason, in this verse, instead of translating it vision, translator, translators, translated as appearance. They could have said the vision of a man. If you go back up in your notes, where it says the vision of the evening and mornings, Daniel 8, 14, he says, And he said unto me, Unto 2,300 days, then shall the sanctuary be cleansed. Uh, we understand correctly, as Seventh-day Adventists, we, when we discuss this verse, generally the, whoever's dealing with it makes his point that the evenings and mornings, um, the, the, the 2,300 days in the Hebrew is actually, um, as is right underneath that first quote of Daniel 8.14, it doesn't say days, it says unto 2,300 evenings and morning. But the King James writes the evenings and mornings as days, unto 2,300. 300 days. What's the point of that? If you look back up above those notes in Daniel 8.26, it says, and the vision, the snapshot vision of the evening and morning, which was told you, is true. I'm, I'm on page 79 of your notes, and uh, I'm, unfortunately I'm kind of working backwards <laughs> just for the flow of thought, so if I'm losing you, we're we're under the, the heading there at the top of the page, the snapshot evening of the vision of the evening and mornings. In verse 26 of Daniel 8, it says, And the snapshot vision, the mare vision, of the evening and mornings which was told is true, wherefore shut up the complete vision. Both these words that are translated vision are in verse 26. The first vision in verse 26 is the snapshot, snapshot vision. The second word translated vision is the complete vision. But the point is this. In verse 26, it's saying the snapshot vision, the mare vision of the evenings and mornings is true, and we know that verse 14 is the evenings and mornings. So what, what verse 26 is telling us is that the snapshot vision is the vision of the 2300 days. And when you put verse 15 with it, where they have translated this same he Hebrew word as appearance, it conveys the truth of this. The vision of the 2300 days, the word that is translated vision, is emphasizing when Christ enters into the most holy place. That amazed, that amazed Daniel. You know, he had some familiarity with Christ. He interacted with God on a genuine basis over a long period of time as a prophet and suddenly he sees a point in time in the future where Christ is the high priest in the heavenly sanctuary and he's amazed by that. It's the appearance. He sees this picture. There's Christ on October 22nd, 1844 doing the work of the high priest on the day of atonement. It's a, it's a, a singular thing that he saw whereas the vision of the Medes and Persians and Greeks and pagan Rome trampling down the sanctuary. It's a vision that covers a long period of time. Okay? Now, you'll notice, and we're running out of time, we'll, we'll continue this in the next presentation in terms of the, the tape that we're doing here, but you'll notice 
that both these visions, once you get them in your mind where they are in the book of Daniel, both these visions have a, a specific point in the book of Daniel where Daniel is informed on what they mean. Daniel isn't really informed on what this vision of the 2300 days, the appearance vision, until Daniel chapter 10. If you pay close attention to the word vision, it's in Daniel chapter 10 where Daniel comes to understand what this vision is all about. And we read that earlier in one of our presentations. Daniel was confronted with Christ. Remember, Sister White says, no less than the personage than the Son of God. And he sees Christ um, in this manifestation, and Daniel falls down on the ground. This vision that he saw here is, once again, this vision, this snapshot vision. And in the passage we read in the Spirit of Prophecy, Sister White kept emphasizing, and I pointed it out for us, that Daniel is a symbol of those at the end of the world that are sanctified, and he's a symbol of those that are going to have this experience. So what Daniel is representing in Daniel 10 is God's people at the end of the world that have a personal confrontation with Jesus Christ during the time period of the investigative judgment. The beginning of Daniel chapter 10, he's not representing the Millerite movement. He's re representing us because the Millerite movement didn't have that experience of, of confrontation with Jesus Christ in the most holy place. That came after October 22nd, 1844. The Millerites were the other side of that in history. So in the opening part of Daniel chapter 10, Daniel is representing God's people at the end of the world that we know as the 144,000. Anyway, you learn that from paying close attention to this word vision and the other word vision as you go through. That's where Daniel learns about this vision. Daniel learns about the complete vision. Where does Daniel learn about the complete vision? We all know this. Daniel chapter 9. Daniel chapter 9. Gabriel comes to him to explain the 2300-day prophecy, and it's broke down into five time prophecies. That's where he gets the explanation on the complete vision. He gets the explanation on the snapshot vision in Daniel chapter 10. There are reasons that we need to understand this, but... What we're emphasizing here is what establishes this complete vision. What establishes? What's our point of reference to make sure that we are correct about the complete vision of the trampling down of the sanctuary and the host? It's Rome. It's Rome. Brothers and sisters, we have to be cl clear about who Rome is. And, and once we understand that the point of reference for bringing this vision at the end of the world into clarity is Rome, we will also find that it's the subject of Rome that establishes the last six verses of Daniel 11. It's the subject of Rome that removes any doubt about those symbols in those verses. And therefore, you find that the subject of Rome is under attack. One of the primary attacks that's taken place about Rome and Adventism is the daily. <laughs> Because the daily represents, according to the pioneers, and Sister White said the pioneers had the correct view of the daily, the daily represents paganism in a general sense and pagan Rome specifically. So if you want to destroy the, the prophetic reference that establishes the vision, you need to destroy the understanding of Rome. And the pioneers said the daily represented Rome. And here we are at the end of the world, and we don't believe that anymore. And what does the Bible say? Where there is no vision, the people perish. And Rome establishes the vision. Although, that verse that says where there is no vision, it isn't the complete vision. It's the snapshot vision. Where there is no experience with Christ in the most holy place, the people perish. But you will find that you cannot separate those two visions. You can't separate them. You can't separate them. The, the 144,000 are going to understand the last six verses of Daniel 11, and they will have an experience in the investigative judgment that they're participating in. Um, here we went over these verses. This is where Daniel understands the snapshot vision. Um, it's in Daniel 10. I, I referenced that to you. In the top of page 80, it says the snapshot vision is true. You'll notice that in Daniel 8, where we first are dealing with the snapshot vision, in verse 26, one of the things that's said about that vision is that it's true. And then in Daniel 10, 1, when it's also going to deal about the snapshot vision, one of the things it says about it is true. This is a, 
a, a tie together so we can be certain that we're talking about the same thing. I'm curious about, okay, t time. Um, as we go through, you'll find that, um, that the snapshot of vision is associated with the river Hittical, and the complete vision is associated with the river Uli. When Daniel receives the vision by the Uli, that's the vision of Daniel 8. And when Daniel receives the vision by the river Hittical, that's the um, vision of Daniel 10, 11, and 12. And Sister White comments uh, about the, the great rivers of Hittical and Uli. Both these visions will soon be fulfilled. We'll read that quote. Um, one of the visions is emphasizing the, the, the vision of how Rome returns to power and then comes to its end and none shall help, while the other vision is emphasizing the work of the investigative judgment. And this is, the prophecy breaks down into do these two themes. Uh, one of the most important quotes in my mind that Sister White gives us in the Great Controversy, she's, she says, the events connected with the close of probation and the need of preparation for the time of trouble have been clearly revealed, but multitudes have no more understanding of these important truths than if they'd never been revealed. The events connected with the close of probation is the last six verses of Daniel 11. That's, that's the, the river um, Hittical, Uli. The need of preparation for the great time of trouble is identifying the, the experience we have to have in the most holy place. These two rivers represent the two themes of prophetic thought. Prophecy teaches you the events that take place as probation closes, while at the same time, it gives you the warning message that you need to have a character prepared for the seal of God when probation does close. And these two rivers, these two visions, Daniel 8, Daniel 10 through 12, represent those two truths. Shall we pray? <coughs> Heavenly Father, we wish to um, be among those that participate in the work that's going on in the most holy place at this time. We've been told very plainly that as the work of removing sin from the heavenly sanctuary in heaven is going on, that your people here on earth um, will be doing a personal work of putting away sin. We want to be among those that um, cooperate with you in this work. And at the same time, we want to be among those that understand this, this vision that is the final warning message that we might share it with those around us um, and win as many to the truth as possible that w the w work might finish and that we can go home and be out of this world of sin. We ask that you would give us um, pieces of truth, pieces of information that would help us accomplish both these tasks. And we thank you for being with us once again here uh, this morning and ask you to continue to bless our studies the rest of this day. In Jesus' name, amen.